Good morning, everyone. We would like to welcome you all to today's Just Recovery press conference. We would like to thank members of the media that are, that are present. Since March 2020, everyone in Hamilton has been dealing with the effects of, co of the COVID-19 pandemic. And these effects have impacted different sections of our community in unique ways. The organizations present here today have been responding to a number of these issues before the pandemic. The pandemic has illustrated the need for residents, organizations, provincial and federal governments to work collaboratively. It is within the spirit that brought all the organizations present here to come together in order to form the Just Recovery Hamilton Coalition for the purposes of amplifying our voices to help the city respond equitably to the pandemic and improve after the pandemic. Today, we are releasing a policy document with over 150 recommendations to start a conversation. We want the community and our city, city councilors, to start thinking about innovative ways that Hamilton can recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. We do not want to go back to business as usual. We need to specifically consider the groups who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and work together to create a bold vision for Hamilton's future. Here we have members of the coalition and our members include ACON Hamilton, the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, Environment Hamilton, the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, Hamilton Community Benefits Network, the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, Sexual Assault Center, Hamilton and Area, the Social Planning and Research Council of Hamilton, Spectrum, and YWCA Hamilton. You will be hearing from representatives of Environment Hamilton, the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, and ACON on the importance of this historic document and the major themes and recommendations. After they are done, we'll open it up uh, to questions from the media. I will now pass it over to Linda Lukasik from Environment Hamilton. Thanks very much, Kojo, and good morning, everyone. I just wanna start by recognizing um, for, for me, me personal and for more, my organization, how wonderful it is to be part of a coalition of organizations like this. Um, and um, I, I wanna say that you know, there, there's real power in this kind of organizing. We all share really important points of alignment um, in the issues that we all work on every day. Um, and, and part of the coming together is recognizing that there are powerful synergies for us to be tapping into. And so that's what this collective has really been working on. So we wanna really underscore that for, for everyone so that you understand why this is such an important coming together. Um, and I wanna just take a little bit of time to talk about some of the issues that, that we've helped to contribute to this list of recommendations that you see and, and to really underscore some of those powerful points of alignment. So I'm going to speak to um, issues that Environment Hamilton has been working on for a long time um, and, and to the power in, in the coming together. Um, the, the pandemic, the crisis has done this. It sparked that ability of us to come together. But, but I also believe that this is really going to help to lay the groundwork for a really important pathway moving forward for all of us to continue to work collectively. So I want to speak to work that we've been doing more and more at Environment Hamilton around building complete communities. As an organization, we talk more and more now about the importance of sustainable, as in environmentally sustainable, climate resilient, uh, because as we like to point out, 
the pandemic is one crisis, but there's a looming tsunami called the climate crisis that hasn't gone away and inclusive. So for us, sustainable, climate resilient, inclusive communities are what we need to be building. So you can see there are all those pieces that bring in the work of other organizations as well. We understand that we're never going to get where we need to be in our vision for uh, complete communities unless we pay attention to all of those things. So right now we're doing a lot of work around mobility issues in the city, ramping up public transit service over time, making sure that active transportation is an option for everyone of all mobility abilities. Um, and, and that in turn, opens the door for everyone to be able to move around our city equitably. Uh, and that's a critical piece. And at the same time, um, that mobility um, that, that is most equitable tends to be the, the mobility that's best for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, for creating a, a post-carbon city that is going to be more climate resilient as we move forward into an uncertain future on that front. So, so there's one really powerful example Another one I wanna share very briefly uh, relates directly to urban growth management in our city. Uh, right now, our city is grappling with how to accommodate future growth. Um, we've got some challenging uh, pressures because of a provincial government that's really trying to push us in a direction that would include sprawling out in pretty significant ways. We're pushing back and we're arguing that um, moving in the direction of more compact urban form is really what's going to get us to the point where we are more climate resilient. But there's also a powerful argument to be made that that approach is going to, is going to help us to tackle things like the, the housing crisis that we face. There are creative solutions that we can pursue that are gonna be far more inclusive and provide that range of affordable housing that, that we need to see emerge in this city. And again, that will link back to, you know, the other pieces that we're working on around mobility justice. So, so I'll stop there, but I, but I hope that starts to paint a picture for you about how there is such huge power in integrating together the issues that all of the organizations that you see before you today are working on. Thanks. And I want to hand it over now, sorry, to Sarah Jama with the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah and I'm with the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. Super happy to be here today. I think one of the beautiful things that I love about Hamilton is this idea that Hamilton has such a large density of people with disabilities in the province. I can go outside, I can go downtown and just see so many people that look like me, that move like me and feel part of a community. And I think that's one of the greatest things about our city. And yet when this pandemic hit, I heard nothing from our counselors really about the fact that Hamilton has the largest density of people with disabilities in this province. And so I think our involvement in this policy paper is to highlight this idea that people with disabilities are being left behind, like we've seen across this country, dying in long-term care homes because of a pandemic and a response to a pandemic that continued to leave people behind. We've also seen that mirrored here locally where a man was literally abandoned in a long-term care home um, when it was being evacuated. Um, we've seen a situation where in our country, we're grappling with this idea that people with disabilities are being left behind because of our inability to be seen as productive or valued in our communities. I wanna see a city where, in a country where people with disabilities have the right to live equally and freely regardless of our ability to produce or to work. I don't wanna see conversations around disability justice tied to our employment. What we need to see and what we've highlighted in this policy paper today is this idea that our city, our municipality is responsible for coming up with an accessibility focused response uh, to the pandemic. And what that looks like to me is addressing the fact that we only have two accessible shelters, two in the entirety of our city, in a city that's saying that people have to stay inside, in a city that's over-policing people living in tents, predominantly who are disabled, who have struggled with visible and invisible disabilities, in a city where you can get kicked out of a shelter for being disruptive. Um, and what often that means exhibiting symptoms of your disability. I want to see a robust policy coming out of our city of Hamilton that actually talks about accessibility and what it means to support people living in our city. What we have seen, for example, has been HSR policies that have literally left people off of the map if you're disabled. You're not, you weren't allowed in the beginning of the pandemic to get onto the bus like everybody else. And so what we're trying to focus on today is this idea that even if you can't hold a job, or even if you're unable to work, even if you're a senior, 
we're living in a residential care home or a long-term care home in our city, you are equal and your rights matter just like everybody else's does. And so that's why I'm super excited to contribute to this paper today. And I'm gonna pass it off to Veronica from ACORN. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, hello, my name is Veronica Gonzalez. I'm a member of ACORN and chair of the Mountain Chapter. ACORN is a community and tenant organization with members of low to moderate income individuals and families across Hamilton. Um, ACORN members have experienced firsthand the negative social and financial impacts created by the pandemic and weak existing social safety nets. We have been evicted, lost our jobs, failed to qualify for EI and other COVID benefits, had to juggle childcare and virtual learning. We have struggled to pay rent and essentials because of minimum wage, ODSB and OW are too low, heavily relied on public transit and faced food insecurity. The recommendations put together by partners of the coalition urgently need to be adopted by the city of Hamilton. I'm going to touch on uh, principles. Uh, the housing is a human right. The Just Recovery for Hamilton Coalition is urging every effort must be made to increase the stock of real affordable housing in the city and to utilize all municipal tools and powers to create bold policy to protect tenants from being displaced. Low and moderate income individuals and families who rent their homes have, very, have not only had to deal with the stresses of the pandemic, but forced to fight to keep their apartments because of lack of financial support to prevent failing, falling behind in rent and lack of local legislation to protect tenants from territory landlords. While Ontario suspended evictions from March until August of last year and gained the and again this week with the second state of emergency, temporary bans of eviction without any rent relief create the eviction crisis we saw in the fall and we can only expect to continue this year. Lastly, we saw the enforcement of apartment property standards drop off the city's priority list during the COVID pandemic. Our coalition is urgently have COVID responses. One, prioritize home during COVID and beyond. Two, urgent to urge the province to suspend eviction enforcement, hearings and orders until province has entered the post-pandemic recovery period and immediately bring a rent relief program. Implement a municipal rent bank where tenant in financial need can receive non-repayment grants and to use all of the city's regulatory powers to protect tenants from predatory renovations practices and save Hamilton's affordable housing stock. All issues in the Just Recovery Report are connected with a lack of support from for low and moderate income communities during the pandemic, we saw a rise in homelessness, strain on our community, legal clinic to keep up with the demand, disproportionate effect on women and essential workers and laid off workers going farther into debt, as well as ongoing barriers in assessing safe, accessible and affordable housing, felt disproportionately by marginalized members of our community. Solutions to the housing crisis must also include climate justice. Tenants in high-rise communities face extreme heat conditions in the summer months and residential buildings should be included in any retrofit programs. And planning to ensure quality green space in neighborhoods with high percentage of renters. COVID-19 showed us, showed the governments that they can act quickly to bring a new policy and invest in programs, seeing people on the streets without a home and seeing 
that there are not enough resources and housing solutions in the city is something we need to address together. City Hall members of the community and the coalition partners. We need the city to expand priority to put the most vulnerable people first and ahead of developers and profit. This is an opportunity to build a better Hamilton for everyone. Um, thank you and uh, thank you and I'll pass it to Kojo. Thank you to uh, Linda from Environment Hamilton, uh, Sarah Jama from the Disability Justice Network of Ontario, and to Veronica from Acon Hamilton. Uh, the policy document also uh, touches upon the, the fact that all of us uh, our organizations and the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territory territories of the Erie Neutral, Erie Neutral, Huron Wandat, and Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Swim One Farm Belt, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe to share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. While we state that in the recommendations, we do say that it is incumbent on us uh, settlers to uh, make sure that the city of Hamilton is supporting uh, com uh, committees such as the Sisters in Spirit uh, Committee that is addressing the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, and also uh, supporting the urban indigenous strategy through op operational funding and capital funding. And I think these are things that we can actively do um, outside of uh, providing land, land acknowledgements and actually doing the work to ensure that we are, we are living in a just, in a just Hamilton. Now, uh, as, as the, the document illustrates, we had uh, nine themes in the document. And those nine themes, uh, I believe, are very, very important as we, as, we, as we move forward. So from investing in women, uh, mobility justice, disability justice, housing as a human right, tackling systemic racism, investing in decent job wages, and supporting our local economy, investing in green infrastructure, and supporting 2S LGBTQQIA plus communities. These are the themes that we need to work on to ensure that we are building an inclusive uh, community. So we will now uh, take questions uh, from the media. You can ask general questions or direct your questions uh, to specific uh, organizations. So just so the media knows once again, uh, we have present uh, Hamilton ACON, Disability Justice Network of Ontario, Environment Hamilton, the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, the Hamilton Community Benefits Network, the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, the Hamilton Roundtable for Poverty Reduction, Sexual Assault Center, Hamilton and Area, the Social Planning and Research Council, and uh, the YWCA. So we'll open it up uh, for questions. And you, you can unmute yourself in an orderly fashion and ask your question. Uh, Kelly Kelly Botello from CHCH. Oh, Kelly doesn't have uh, a mic, so she's going to type her question. Go ahead, Kelly.
going to be a long question. Okay. The question is, what is your expectation from the city of Hamilton? Is this being presented to them? Yes, so the expectation from the city is that they will they will read the policy document. It has over 150 recommendations. And yes, uh, the, the policy document has been uh, presented to them. It's been sent to the mayor, all city councilors, and uh, the heads of uh, various departments. So the city manager, uh, the economic development, um, the, all the major uh, departments that have uh, specific department heads, they have a copy of uh, the policy document. Is there a follow-up from, Ke from Kelly? Did the pandemic highlight equity issues that already existed? Yes, it did. <laughs> yes, it did. That's the that's the short answer of it. Yes, it did. Um, uh, for all the organizations that have been present here, uh, we did know that uh, these equity issues have been exacerbated. Whether uh, we're dealing with um, violence in the home, whether we're talking about uh, uh, housing issues, whether we're talking about racism, hate, uh, these are all the things that were exacerbated. So yes, the pandemic has highlighted issues that already existed. What have you been, uh, the next question is, what have you been hearing from Hamiltonians who are struggling right now. Um, so I will pass it over to uh, uh, Jessica Bonilla Dante from the Sexual Assault Center, Hamilton and area, who can highlight uh, some of the uh, some of those issues. Buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, in terms of sexual violence, we've been hearing from the survivors of sexual violence here in Hamilton. Um, that the pandemic has created big concerns for them, um, not only in terms of survivors of sexual violence, but in terms of having food security, in terms of their housing, um, their their housing, and not being able to know if they'll have a house uh, to live in because of um, evictions that are happening in our city. Um, survivors of sexual violence are uh, letting us know through our crisis support line calls that not being able to have face-to-face -face counseling. Um, is a big concern for them uh, because they don't have access to the internet. Um, so we we see all of the issues that are mentioned within um, our policy paper and that are presented to the city and to the people of Hamilton um, that we have to take an inter intersectional approach to these issues um, and to our responses to these issues. Surrounded with sexual violence are letting us know that the isolation is devastating for their mental health and well-being. We also know that survivors of sexual violence, including survivors of gender-based violence, um, we are in a lockdown right now, our, our second lockdown, um, stay at home orders are in place and that is not safe for, for survivors of sexual violence and um, survivors of, of gender-based violence because many times there are found to be locked at home with their abuser and their perpetrator. Um, so these are some of the things that we're hearing at the Sexual Assault Center and that we know um, our reality is during this pandemic and we hope that um, our uh, municipal and all of our elected um, uh, representatives uh, take seriously and take into account when um, thinking about what a just recovery for Hamilton looks like. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, the some of the, the issues that uh, Sasha highlighted and others that have been highlighted, our expectation is that uh, There'll be delegations made by the organizations that are present here. And uh, we will also be having uh, public and social discussions with residents and other organizations. And I hope that they'll be able to 
go to uh, the public delegation on February the 8th to let uh, let the city know that these things need to be addressed so that we can have uh, a just Hamilton for all. Uh, there's another question from Kelly. Uh, the question reads, what led to the eviction crisis in the spring that was mentioned, even though evictions are now and were stopped? So I will hand that over to ACON and, uh, and any of the organizations that might want to comment. Uh, yes. Um, so eviction um, started when um, the, uh, the the rent uh, control was lifted. I don't exactly remember what year, but it was lifted by Doug Ford, and then uh, landlords started to um, found a, a loophole there that they can um, a, tactically move people out and uh, kick people out and, and evict them so they can, so new pe people can come in, new tenants can come in and, and increase the rent and, and get uh, very high profits on these units. So I, th I think that's where it started. And, um, and now with the COVID crisis, it hasn't stopped and it's gotten worse because of the unemployment that has increased during the uh, pandemic, the layoffs and just not having enough unemployment insurance to cover or having not enough benefit and already having a high cost of living. Um, so all these things have been neglected, have, been, have not been considered. When the rent control was lifted, um, you know, uh, all the low-income families to moderate and disability and all DSP people were left behind. Uh, they, were, they were not considered at this point and the issue just no protections on rent relief programs or, um, or anything like that. Uh, the issue has gotten worse on the evictions. Um, I think that's, that's how it has gotten worse. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think we have a follow up. So we'll do one, the last question from Kelly, and then we'll, we'll see if other, other, uh, media folks have questions. Um, uh, uh, the last question from from, or the follow-up question from Kelly was, do temporary pauses on evictions not work? I can pass it over to ACORN or the legal clinic. I can comment on that from the legal clinic. This is Ali Nergi. I'm a staff lawyer at the Hamilton Legal Clinic. Um, the temporary pause on evictions work in the short term. Uh, they're a Band-Aid solution and they, are, they don't fix the root cause of the problem, unfortunately, which is a, a mass eviction movement uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. Uh, right now, the province, again, imposed a new temporary suspension, which is only for two weeks. Uh, they are still continuing the uh, eviction hearings on the landlord tenant board. There's a huge access to justice issue with these hearings because a lot of the tenants don't have access to internet to be able to get on Zoom calls or sorry, to be able to use the Microsoft Teams platform that the landlord tenant board has set up uh, for tenants to call in. A lot of low income tenants don't have access to a working phone. And what happens as a result is that they miss their hearings. They are not able to reasonably participate in these hearings and they are disproportionately negatively affected by the format of the current landlord tenant board uh, as it is set up. So uh, to, to answer your questions, yes, they may work in the short term, some of these uh, measures by the province, but they actually do not solve the problem in the long term. And so, you know, that, that's why 
this work is really important so that we can come up with a solution, with a long-term solution that actually helps low-income tenants sustain tenancies and be able to, you know, live uh, in a unit with dignity and, and, and not be able to force, not be forced out uh, due to not, not their fault. I mean, a lot of low-income tenants have lost jobs. They work in precarious employment. Um, as a result of the COVID pandemic, they are not able to afford rents and you know rents are, keep going higher and higher so uh i hope that answers the question but again it's just a band-aid solution at this point can i also add something is that okay mm -hmm. i also want to say like even even without the employment rate being a struggle people with disabilities have been stuck on social assistance rates, whether it's through OW or ODSP, because we know disabled people access both um, social assistance programs. The, it's, the amount that people get to live is not sustainable. It's not enough to pay rent and buy food. Um, that's why we're having grassroots organizations go out and deliver food uh, to disabled people across the city every single week. Uh, regardless of our employment rates, we have legislated people into a situation where if you actually cannot work, uh, you cannot survive in our communities. And that's also a problem. So this temporary eviction ban of two weeks is not going to stop the fact that many people who are being evicted are on fixed incomes with these programs that are not increasing. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, media folks? CTV, any questions? CBC Hamilton, any questions? TVO, any questions? Okay, if there, there aren't any further questions, uh, we would like to end uh, by saying the this is an unprecedented this is an unprecedented uh, time and in an unprecedented time there needs to be an unprecedented response and that is why all these organizations have come together we are mindful and we we acknowledge that the report uh, highlights and details. Uh, suggestions, recommendations, and themes that are not exhaustive in uh, the response that our city and our province and our federal government need uh, to respond to. But we're doing this in, an, in a collaborative manner, in a manner in which we all have to come together to understand the many challenges and how we respond uh, to these challenges. So this is an invitation to other organizations, businesses, and individuals to sign up uh, with the coalition. Uh, our website is just recoveryhamilton.ca. All our information is, is, avail is available there. We are also encouraging residents to share their vision of a just recovery and delegate at the public delegation day on February the 8th, 2021, so that uh, our represented uh, municipal officials and city staff will be able to hear uh, their stories, their visions, their struggles, their concern, so that that information can be incorporated into how we respond uh, or how we, we create a budget that, says, that serves everyone in Hamilton. We also, from now, from now till February the 8th, we'll be, have, we'll be having public and social campaigns uh, 
all the teams that the, all the nine teams that we face come along with excellent uh, graphic work uh, from Sunny Singh, who works here in Hamilton as an independent illustrator. And we want to use that to galvanize people to participate in how uh, decisions are made for us to, to, to move forward. So we'll be having those, those conversations. There'll be an open forum for Environment Hamilton, Acorn Hamilton and the Hamilton Community Benefits Network will be hosting two workshops to uh, uh, share the, the, uh, the recommendations with residents and to also talk about how our budgets are created and how they can delegate at, uh, at, city, at city council and connect with their councillors and, and our mayor. And so that is, that is our hope. And this is just a beginning of uh, the work that's needed to chart us onto a path where we respond to the equitable needs of everyone in Hamilton. Uh, to my colleagues, are there any, is there anyone that would like to say any, any last words before we sign off? Just uh, quickly, I wanna, remind members of the media that um, we are available and, and Trojo can pass on contact information for every organization. So as you digest this press conference and, and move forward, if you have any questions for any of the individual organizations, Kojo can get you a, a contact list to uh, reach out to any one of us. If you have specific questions about specific areas in the document, we uh, make ourselves available to you all. Any other final comments from my colleagues? Okay, all right. So thank you uh, to the members of the media for attending. And uh, yes, as Carl said, you can contact us and we provide further information to you. So thank you very much and uh, see you all soon. <laughs>